Hello, welcome to our talk on the sincerest form of flattery and to JFocus. I hope you're enjoying the conference. The, the sincerest form of flattery in the English proverb is said to be imitation. And this talk is about how functional languages, or rather how object-oriented languages, have gradually imitated the best features of functional languages. It's not been a completely straightforward process. We're going to describe some of the, the hitches along the way in the incorporation of functional features into Java and into Scala. And we hope at the end of this that as, a, as Java programmers, you'll have a better concept, a, a better understanding of why things are done the way they are in Java. And you'll have some, um, you'll have some foresight of new features that are coming uh, in really soon now in, in, in Java, translated, transplanted from functional languages. If you're a Scala programmer, you can just look at this and feel smug. <laughs> so, I'm Maurice Naftalin. I've written about Java 5 and about Java 8. I'm putting those books up because they're actually references for a lot of the material we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm a member of various community programs, including the Java Champions, and I have um, been a rock star speaker at Java One and Oracle One. This is Jose. And my name is Jose. I'm very glad to welcome you. Uh, here are some links to the content I try to provide and organize on the internet, both on YouTube and other places. And uh, we are currently recording this session. Uh, Maurice is in Edinburgh. I live near Paris. And we are delivering this talk for the Stockholm JFocus conference. So that's probably the, the beginning of a new era where we are doing so many things virtually and online. But OK, that, that's, that's how it is. And I'm also part of the Java Champion community and also been elected the uh, Java One Rockstar several times. OK, so let's go. What is, what's the, what is the point of this? Well, functional programming has been around for as long as programming has been around, or almost. And, and computing scientists have always really liked functional programs, functional programming languages. They're elegant, they're mathematically sound, it's easy to prove the properties of them, and it's easy to convey complex ideas in them in a clear way. The, the, the key elements of uh, functional programming languages have been present for a long time. They came in progressively, higher order functions, which we know of as lambdas in Java, came in the 1950s. Parametric polymorphism, which we know as generics, came in the 1970s, and pattern matching in the 1980s. These have been around a long time, and they're well proven top. Um, they're well proven ideas in programming. But for all of that, functional programming languages have never really become widely popular in the commercial environment mainly because they tend to be, functional programs tend to be quite inefficient. Without a great deal of care, they're expensive, both in terms of time to execute and in terms of memory. Object-oriented languages, by contrast, have been very successful. They can be made, they can be made very efficient. Um, they, they have very positive features of their own. So, so um, object orientation brings with it subtype polymorphism, which we know as inheritance, strong static typing, which has been a, a, a big feature of Java from the very start, and automatic memory management, a huge aid to programmer productivity. But for all of that, uh, object oriented languages have always suffered from feature envy when they look at, um, when they look at functional languages. Here's our picture of uh, functional languages besides object or beside object oriented ones. So I, I, knew, I knew we should have changed places, Maurice. <laughs> I know we've got it right. We've got it right. Beauty of the beast. So, <laughs> oh, so very early on in the evolution of Java in 1997, when Java was really still a very new, very new language. My friend Phil Wadler, the bearded guy on the right, who's a very well-known functional programming academic, was told by a student of his that he should pay attention to a whizzy new language called Java. And together with Martin Odersky, who, the picture on the left, who went on to develop Scala, they, uh, they created a proof of concept called Pizza, which showed how, in principle, it would be possible to add these three features of functional programming languages into the into the newborn Java. And what happened after that was that following the, uh, the, the presentation of Pizza, Sun Microsystems adopted it 
and they focused on the on the generics element and produced a, another proof of concept language, the, uh, Adersky and Wadler with another two contributors from Sun, creating a language called again a proof of concept language called generic Java, and that handled the backward compatibility the backward compatibility problems that we're going to be talking about today. But those problems were great and they frustrated uh, Odersky enough that he decided to go off and start from scratch with a totally new language, Scala, which uh, was launched in 2003. The resistance and the difficulty of getting generics into Java meant that it wasn't until, 19, until 2004, a year later, that, that generics actually appeared in Java 5. So Scala was able to eat pizza in one bite, generics, closures and pattern matching all in one go. Uh, but uh, Java, by contrast, has taken three uh, attempts to incorporate the ideas of pizza. Parametric polymorphism, generics in 2004, higher order functions or lambdas in 2014 and pattern matching in 20, you know, real soon now. Real soon. Jo Jose will be talking about that a lot later on. So let's have a look at each one of these, uh, each one of these features in, in a little bit more detail. Java Generics is the one that has suffered most from the, back, from the problem of backward compatibility. The, the biggest single problem that the, that the designers of Generic Java faced was that they knew that during migration from non-generified or legacy types to generified types, there was going to be incompatibilities between library and client code. Library code would change at some point from raw types, from using raw types, that is non-generified ones, to using generified ones. So we've got here, a, a, we're imagining a library method which is going to return a list of string, but prior to generics can only return a raw list without any generic type information. And the client code that is calling that also has to make the same, a similar change, a corresponding change, in going from expecting to get a raw list to expecting to get a generified list, a list of string. So the problem about this migration is that these two changes in the client and in the library can't, take, can't be guaranteed to take place at the same time, and they can't, you don't even know what order they're going to take place in. So any combination of any of the uh, variants of the client code, either of the variants of the client code, with either of the variants of the library code is possible, or, and all four of the combinations have to work for migration to be successful. And migration was successful, so in talking about how they dealt with it, I don't want to suggest that this was a mistake. Type erasure, which I'm going to talk, which I'm going to talk about now, was necessary in order for migration to succeed, and therefore in order for Java to remain in the <coughs> forefront of programming languages. So all four contributions had to, all four combinations had to work. And what that meant was that the, for binary compatibility, the runtime representation of a list, a raw list, had to be the same as the runtime representation of a list of string. And since there is no uh, run runtime representation of the generic type of a raw list, it's not there. What that meant was that there could be no runtime representation of the generic type of a list of string either. It had to be erased. And, and, the, um, and therefore, the solution that the generic Java designers adopted was type erasure. Type erasure is a, is, is, is a method by which the, the, the generic types are used by the compiler to do strict uh, type checking at compile time. And and is then discarded, so the, the generic information does not persist at runtime. So you get all of the advantages of generic types in terms of, in terms of ensuring that the type scheme is correct, and there are many advantages which I'm not going to go into here. But, the, but the, prob the problem is, the drawback is, you don't get to use them at runtime, and that has some consequences. One consequence is that you can't do a runtime test, like instance of, on a parametric type. So here, here we're taking a, the, the type of param to this method is a, is a generic type T, and we would like to ask at, com, at runtime, has, it, has the, the parameter that's been supplied here, is it of type string? And we can't ask that question at runtime because the type T has disappeared at runtime. It's been erased. An even more irritating drawback is that you can't create arrays of generic types. 
in general, we're going to see that the typing scheme for arrays is not really compatible with the typing scheme for, for generics. And this is one particular way in which it isn't. Arrays, unlike generics, do know their, their, um, their type, their component type at runtime. They know it and it's actually, it's actually baked into the definition of the, the, of, the, of the array at runtime. So in this case, we are, the red code there is trying to make an array of a, of a type which can't exist at runtime. List of integer doesn't exist at runtime, so you can't have an array of it. And that code therefore is illegal. The type is perfectly well defined. On the left hand side, the type is defined and that's fine. But you can't actually create an instance of it. How irritating is that? And that brings me on to the second big problem of backward compatibility with generics. And that is, that's the way that variance is implemented in arrays from the, compared to the way it was implemented in generics. So what's variance about? Well, from the start, Java needed generic methods. You want to be able to sort arrays right from the very beginning. Like in this uh, method from the arrays utility class, which sorts an array of objects. Actually, this, this method wasn't introduced until JDK 1.2, but people were writing methods like this right from the start in JDK 1.0, and the language would have had absolutely no plausibility without it. So they, you want to be able to sort, or you want to be able to write generic methods to, to sort arrays because you're going to have arrays of, of integer that you want to be able to sort, and you're going to have arrays of strings that you want to be able to sort. But for this to work, for both of those calls to work, the type of, of integer array, that is the type of ints, must be a subtype of the, of the object array type that sort is expecting. And similarly for the array of string. So integer array and string array must be subtypes of object array. This is called covariant typing because the, the type of the array integer array and string array varies in the same way as the type of the components, integer and, and object. So covariant typing was the, was the type scheme that was adopted for arrays and this works sort of okay but it's got some drawbacks. One consequence of it is what's shown on this slide or about to be shown. We're creating, we're creating here an array of integer we are assigning a reference of, to that array of integer to an, to a, an array of, to a variable of type number array. We're taking, a, we're retrieving an element from that number array and, and assigning it to a variable of type number, and that works fine. Because and this is an important point: covariantly typed containers are good for retrieving values from, but they're not good for putting values into. So when we try and put a value into it, and the code, the red code on the left there. Is, is statically perfectly well typed. A double is indeed a, a, a subtype of number, so it should work. But remember that arrays know their component type at runtime. And so that, so what should be a compile time error becomes instead a runtime exception. Now, they didn't want this situation for, uh, for generics. And so they adopted a different scheme, invariant typing. A, a list of integer is not a subtype of a list of number. In fact, it does has no direct relation to a list of to a list of number at all. So that was great. We don't get the problem that I showed there. But wait a moment. We introduced this because we really needed covariant typing for, for example, a sort method. And in fact, Java five does have Java five and subsequently does indeed have, indeed have a sort method defined in Java util collections, which works on a list of something. So invariant typing is really helpful because it helps to avoid the problem that we saw in earlier, earlier on. But remember why we had that in the first place. We've lost something because we still need generic methods and we needed covariance to achieve that. And the Java Util Collections utility class does indeed contain a sort method defined on list of something. But what is a something there? Now we know that anything that is going to be sortable must, in, must implement the comparable in, interface. In, in, the values of that type know how to compare themselves with one another. But, the, but comparable is an interface. We can't uh, provide a type there, which is a list, of, a, a, a list of comparable, if it's going to exactly match comparable. Because, of course, there are no types which, are, which exactly match comparable, except comparable itself. 
We want, there are lots of things we want to be able to sort that are subtypes of comparable. So we need to, re, so we need to re, restore covariance again. And the way that they did that was with um, uh, bounded types in, in, in generic Java. And, and the bounded type uh, uses the extends keyword to say that, in this case, T extends comparable is like a range of types, which are subtypes of comparable. And list of T extends comparable is indeed a subtype of list of comparable. So we got covariance back again, which is good. And in fact, bounded types give us something else as well, because we also got at the same time, we got, we, we got or in a very similar way, we got contravariance. Covariance is when the type of the container varies along with the type of its component. Contravariance is when it varies in the opposite direction. So a list of T uh, super number is a super type of list of number. And, th and that's useful because if covariant containers are good for getting values out of, contravariant ones are good for putting values into. And here to demonstrate that, we've got a little method, um, uh, an append method, which take, uh, takes a covariantly defined source list and takes the values from that and puts them into a contravariantly defined destination list. And the, here's the body of the loop, which, which steps over the, each of the source elements. And it's retrieving a source element from the covariantly defined container and putting it into the contravariantly defined destination. And that, therefore, we can write a line of code at the end, which is a call on append, which takes a list of number of, in, of integer and, and appends them to a list of number. So, so that's the, these are some of the problems and the way that they overcame them in, uh, in, in Java if the, for the introduction of generics. So how does Scala handle the issue of variance in generics? It was a new language, free of the constraints and the backward compatibility problems of Java. And so they could start off not only with a new language but, and a new type system, but also with a new collections library. So one of the things that's, uh, that has become much more fashionable since, uh, in programming since Java was introduced, but was uh, already very current at the, time, at the time that Scala was created, and that was, by the way, also a, an introduction from functional programming, was, the, um, was the, the idea of immutability being useful. So immutability is, uh, is now seen as a very desirable uh, characteristic of, of containers, or at least of some containers, and it would be really nice if we could have a uh, container type which could be which could be immutable by declaration. And if you define variance at the time that the uh, at the time that the type is declared, and if you declare the type to be covariant, the, the container to be covariantly typed, then the compiler will ensure that you will never make a you'll never try to assign an element to it. So here we have, in, in, so in, in Scala, we have a, a pair class here with, that takes a, a parameter, a type parameter T, and the plus sign there indicates that that T is to be treated as a, covariantly, a covariant type. And the, re, and the result of that is that uh, the container will be, by definition, covariantly typed, whatever call is made on it. If to do the same thing in, in, in Java, you would define a pair class, but you can't say what the type of T is in, in that definition. And therefore, when you want to, want to make a call on it, like in this case, we've got a two-string method, which is going to take an element out, going to take the elements out of the pair. In other words, require them to be covariant. The, the parameter... The, the, uh, the type parameter to pair that is used there, the question mark, it's actually a shorthand for T extends object. And it's the, the client programmer has had to say, I want this pair to be treated as a covariantly typed container at this point. Now in Scala, by contrast, if you wanted to do the same thing, you can simply write this. Uh, you can define your two string method on a pair of any valve, which is object for Scala. And the work of Handling, covar handling variance, whether covariance or contravariance, has been taken away from the client programmer and given to the library writer instead. Well, I mean, that's what library writers should be doing for a living. They have to, they have to deal with complex questions. And client coders, I'm a client coder, should, should, should have an easy time. Don't you think so, Jose?
Yes, absolutely. I absolutely think so. Yeah. Okay. Totally agree with that. So declaration site variance simplifies client code. And in fact, there's a proposal in the pipeline, I don't know where exactly, that um, for declaration site variance to be introduced into Java as well. So, so this is so this is uh, ties up the generics part and shows that the advantage of starting from scratch with a uh, with a, a language which could be defined and actually redefined as time went uh, as uh, with the with the advantage of the experience of generic Java gave Scala in, uh, in, in general a, a more a more elegant and uh, and, and more com more complete representation of generics. Part two of this talk is closures and lambdas. Uh, what Pizza did for closures was to try to solve the question about how functions could be introduced into a language which didn't have them in the type system. So the Java type system was a type system of an object-oriented language. Functions weren't in it. You could rewrite the type system to include them, but that would be a big deal. And this, their solution instead was for each function to create an abstract class. In other words, fitting into the existing type system and to use that as a wrapper, in a sense, for an apply method, which would be the, the, the implementation, the real implementation of the function. They had to make an important design, design decision for, uh, for taking Java forward about whether these functions would capture non-final local variables. Because if they did that, then potentially the function could be executed at a time the environment had changed very dramatically and it could be executed on different threads. So it makes programming a, a lot more complex and uh, also a lot more flexible and powerful closures that, uh, that capture variables are, uh, but it also, it also endangers the thread safety, which Java programs have relied on local variables being thread safe since forever. That's been that's been a very basic thing. So they made the so, but as far as pizza was concerned, they didn't. They sat on the fence on this important issue, and understandably, because Adursky went off and allowed Scala and in Scala allowed non-final local variables to be captured, but Java has never has never gone down that road. Functions are first-class citizens in 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 pizza so the syntax looks like this here we have a, a max method which takes a list and a function from two s's it's a generic method so it takes a, a function of two s's and returns a boolean and uh, and it and it applies that function to the to the list or it should do the examples um, the example the example is isn't perfect so an example of 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 that function would be would be the the one that, the one that we have here, which which takes two strings and compares and compares them for length and uh, will return true or false depending on whether the first string is longer or not or uh, as whether the, whether the first string is longer than the second uh, or whether or whether they're less than or equal less than or equal to it. And so in, so in this way, this, the, 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 the function there is actually neatly, neatly wrapped up in, in, the syntax of the, in, the, in the syntax of the language. And higher order functions like, like that one can be passed around as parameters and treated in this, and assigned to variables and essentially treated as first class, as first class citizens. And this has been the, the case ever since, um, in functional languages, ever since Lisp in the 1950s. So when they introduced lambdas into Java in 2006, the debate over whether to, whether, how to handle the, the introduction of a function type was uh, actually really quite, quite a, an intense debate, and it held things up for quite a long time. It was eventually resolved, a long time later, in favour of the, the pizza solution of using a single abstract method within a, not an abstract class, as Pete had suggested, but within an, inter within an interface. And these are functional interfaces as we know them today. They are, in effect, the wrappers for the function that is implemented by the apply method of the, of the single abstract, well, by, the, by, the, by however it's named, the single abstract method of the, of the functional interface. That meant there was no change in the type system, and it was quite an, it was a hack, but quite an elegant hack to introduce functions into the language without massive, without a massive upheaval, 
and, and, and worked very well from that point of view. Uh, they, made, they made a decision for uh, non-final local variables that both for the point of view of preserving thread safety, because local variables had always been regarded as, um, as thread safe from time immemorial, and for backward compatibility, because many programs actually depended on that thread safety, they decided that non-final local variables could not be captured by lambdas. Some people, this is a controversial decision because some people say they aren't real closures, JavaScript programmers in particular, but also, as we'll see, Scala programmers. But some, but some people, and I'm among them, think that that was a good decision. And I think you think so too, don't you, Jose? Yes, I do, absolutely. So, Backward uh, compatibility was really a must. So closures in Scala, um, they could start with a, with a, a, a brand new language and therefore a, a type system that could be uh, designed from scratch and therefore could incorporate functions as a, as a basic part of it. And so functions are first-class citizens in a very genuine way in Scala. They made a different decision about, about capturing the uh, variables and they, uh, they decided that it could happen, as with JavaScript. And when I asked a Scala expert the question, how does that work with concurrency? The answer came back, it doesn't. So essentially, uh, local variables are not thread safe in, in Scala. And that means you have to do quite a lot more work to ensure that threads don't uh, interfere with one another in the handling of, of local variables, which becomes shared state. So that was a, it's a different design decision leading to a very different style of programming. So... Jose, would you like absolutely. to talk about partial application? Yes, absolutely. So partial application is, is another classical operation. It's in functional programming. It has been here for a while. And you, we can do partial application in Java. Now, wh what it is really, it's a very simple concept by which you take a B function, for instance, and you can make it a function just by providing a value for one of its parameters. And, and this value is fixed, right? And you could do the same to take a function and make it a supplier by fixing the, the only parameter that function take. Now, if you want to do that in Java, we probably have to write the method we have here, which is a very simple example with the index of method. We are looking for a small string s in a bigger string, which is called word here. And it turns out, in fact, that in this example, we can write this partial application using a method reference. Now, method reference is not really meant to implement this partial application concept, but it's still something that can be used to do that, and it's very nice. Now, it turns out that in Scala, we have a special syntax to do that, which is a little complex, but probably more finished than the, 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 the Java, and more specific than the Java syntax. Here we have the same method, partial application, that was defined in the Java code on the previous slide, and we are just using that by function here to, to, to apply it to a word and to a string of character s, and we are executing this b function, right? Now, in Scala, you can define b function uh, as it is, uh, as with this syntax, with the first parameter and then the second parameter, that is the application of the first one to the second one, and then the implementation of the b function. And with this syntax, you can use partial application right within the syntax of the language, quite naturally. This is the syntax that we do not have in Java, that is maybe a little more complex in Scala, but that is still very nice. We can say, we can say, put it in that way, I think. All right. And now we have pattern matching, which is, which is the last part of this talk, and uh, with brand new things that are, uh, been, that are going to be introduced in the Java language in the next few weeks or months, and some, other, some others in the next few years, hopefully. What is pattern matching? Pattern matching in pizza has been implemented in that way. Here we have three concepts, in fact, from functional programming on this slide. The first one is the concept of sealed type. This definition, class vehicle and the two cases, case car and case bus, tells us that the type vehicle can only be extended by those two types, car and bus, and that's it. It's called the seal type in the sense that when you declare it, you also declare all the types that can extend this one. And this is something that is coming in the Java language. We are going to be able to do that. The second one is the concept of record. 
here car is a record in a sense that it's defined on a component which is a color and we're going to see that in details in the next slide in Java because records are also coming to the Java language and then we have this switch syntax which is using really pattern matching here it's a switch on the type of the vehicle and we know that this vehicle type can only have two values which is car and bus so we do not need this default clause anymore which is nice because most of the time it was just in your way as a developer so we can get rid of it now and and the the, the case here uh, takes the, the the record as a parameter car color and this color is the is, it's just the the definition of the component of this record that has been previously declared of course and the compiler is able to deconstruct this record it knows that the car is created on this component think about a field this component is called color and then you can use this color as a variable in the proper scope what syntax does it give in Scala? Well, it gives the, the, the following syntax with a trait which is a vehicle and the two cases of vehicle that are declared in the Scala language and of course the um, the switch on the types which is both exhaustive and which allows for deconstruction just as in pizza now the nice thing in java is that we are going to have this but step by step the first um, pattern matching that we are going to have is called pattern matching for instance of and it's going to be delivered in jdk 16 that is just one month from now a few weeks from now when you will see this um, this recording uh, you just declare o and you ask yourself is it an instance of string and and this is what we've been doing for years in java but now we can say oh is it an instance of string of s and if it is an instance of string the compiler will create this s variable for you and you'll be able to use this variable in a proper scope that is in the first branch of the if and this is the case here you can use this s to get the length of that string and of course in the else clause of the, of the if s it doesn't make any sense so it's not defined in that scope this is the first part of pattern matching called pattern matching for instance of this this is something that is being delivered to the JDK just now now the next step will uh, have to deal with the sealed types and the sealed types is also something delivered in JDK 16 we'll be able to define sealed type it works for interfaces track classes and uh, regular classes and it says that when you declare a type you can declare all the subtypes that are allowed to extend these types and this is this particular syntax permits and here we have two classes car and bus and the car is a special type of class that we're going to see in a minute and and this this um, this authorization of being able to extend this type is enforced both at compile time and also at runtime and if uh, even if you're using very uh, tricky stuff using agents or uh, reflection or this kind of thing you will not be able to further extend this type at runtime this is strongly enforced at the JVM level right now we have a regular class here which is the bus class that implements vehicle and we have this special class which is also uh, a new stuff delivered in, J in JDK 16 which is called the record class now what is a record think of a Java bean with a special syntax to declare it you know this java bean as a as a mutable state it has getters and setters and 90 percent of the time you need to uh, override the equals hash code and two string method well the record get, gets you covered with that just declare record class color color becomes a component of that record and the compiler will generate all the technical uh, code for you including the field the constructor the getter the fields are going to be final the class is immutable so you won't have any setter and also an equals hash code method and a two string method that you can override if you wish to do so with a special syntax within the record so this record is something that at compile time is declared on the component just as it was in the pizza stuff so it means that we can deconstruct a record and this is something that is coming to the language it's not there yet but this is something that is going to be to be implemented so it will give this kind of syntax of course this syntax can change it's just something it's still a work in progress you have the switch 
The switch is exhaustive. You don't need the default stuff because you already know that the, only the car and the bus types are allowed to extend the, the vehicle type. Uh, if you have a car built on a color element, then you'll be able to deconstruct this car and get the value of this component and use that component as a variable in the proper scope. Uh, same kind of thing for the bus. And you can do something more that, that you can't do in the pizza language. That is, if the value of the color component is red, then you'll be able to define a special case in this switch expression. So this is really great, and this is something we are going to have in the next future. This is part of the Amber project. The Amber project of the JDK, of the Open JDK, is meant to bring pattern matching in the, in the Java language. And by the way, this Amber project is a reference to uh, the, the Chronicles of Amber, which was a set of books uh, popular in the 70s and the 80s. And uh, you know that in, in the Amber world, which is a multiverse, if you walk on a proper pattern, you can move from one dimension to the other. So that, that's, that's the reference of the Ember project. Right, and now we are at the conclusion of this talk. We hope this talk has been satisfying in, in the sense of both looking backwards to understand what's happened in the past and to look forwards in the sense to anticipate features that are just now arriving. A conclusion that we can draw from this is language design is really a really, really complicated business. Backwards compa compatibility, when you have to deal with uh, features that have been were introduced without thought for the future makes it even more complicated. And if you're going to also take account of the features that you're going to introduce in the future as well, that means that you're now traversing a very complex multidimensional design space. Java takes it very seriously because Java places a very high value on backwards compatibility. You can still run in modern versions of Java code that was written 20 and 25 years ago. Scala made a different decision. The designers decided there that fast language evolution was more important than backward compatibility. And the result, and the result is that the language hasn't been very stable, but it has, evolved, it has evolved very quickly. So both viewpoints have their advantages and both have their disadvantages. We, Java has gone with a conclusion uh, pronounced by Brian Getz, the Java language architect, who said... <laughs> yeah, the, he, basically Brian Getz said that uh, several years ago at the JVM Summit in uh, San Francisco, saying that we don't want to be the first to introduce a feature because every feature we add will never be removed. It will stay there forever. And we both know, Maurice, that forever is indeed a very long time. A very, a very long time. So we hope you've enjoyed the talk. Thank, Thank you for you. listening. Thank you very much and see you soon. Bye.